the second lecture of the d today is by uh, Nina Power, as Rista said. Uh, the talk is on materialist feminism and radical feminism, revisiting the second wave in the light of recent controversies. Uh, Nina is a philosopher and writer and the author of many articles on politics and culture, as well as being the author of the book, One Dimensional Woman. Um, so Nina, if you wanna go ahead. Yeah, sure, is this, is this okay? Um, I'm kind of doing a double talk because I'm talking to everyone who's in the garden here and also to everyone uh, online as well. So this is a little bit strange, it's quite uh, uncanny. Um, I'll have to pitch my voice <laughs> in a certain way. Um, okay, I want to thank uh, Katerina and Zach and others for organizing this event. And also uh, just to comment on uh, how fortunate it is uh, to actually make it to Skopje and to be in this garden with people uh, in the real, with, with some cats as well, lots of amazing cats. Um, I think all conferences should be outside with smoking and cats. Um, okay, so some of what I'm gonna say does kind of overlap with Alenka's paper in some way, although it's not nearly as uh, Lacanian or as rigorous. <laughs> um, so I wanted to, yeah, return to some of these kind of central questions of second wave feminism um, as I see it. Um, and I wanted to go through, in a, it's going to be a slightly complicated journey through some of these themes, actually. And uh, I wanted also to put some of these questions in a kind of political or social context. Uh, and in that sense, they might have more of a kind of empirical rather than theoretical um, dimension. Um, because I think it's important to, to kind of make that clear. Um, and to, for us to all try and understand the context in which some of these discussions are, are happening uh, and not be afraid of that, I suppose. Um, I want to state from the outset that um, it's my conviction that the feminis feminisms loosely termed second wave are not yet concluded, right? Which is to say the concerns of, of feminism of this period regarding feminism's relation to various other disciplines, so including Marxism, but also to history, to culture, to, ecolo to ecology and the environment, to nature, to race, to men, technology, and so on, remain live questions that have not yet been transcended or di displaced by shifts, any shifts in social, technological, or historical development, right? That's my uh, starting axiom, if you like. Despite uh, the wish among many, perhaps, to kind of move beyond the second wave, um, you know, whether we're talking about a kind of technophilic feminism in the wake of Shulamith Firestone, perhaps the idea that uh, developments in reproductive uh, technology uh, have already inaugurated kind of shifts in how we understand uh, reproduction as such. Um, I don't think that developments in reproductive technology um, have been accompanied. Uh, by rev social revolution at the level of sex class as she predicted um, would happen or, or hypothesized in the dialectic of sex. Uh, in other words, techno-feminism has not escaped techno-capitalism. It's not outside of it. I want to remain therefore with the, the, um, the tensions and difficulties of radical materialist, deconstructionist and psychoanalytic feminism. So in that sense, it's not a kind of strong conclusion. There's merely this conviction at the outset that this project, all of these projects are not yet finished. They're still posing the right questions. In the light of, of in particular, of the ongoing seeming difficulty of defining women in anything other than negative terms, which seems to be a kind of inherent feature of thought and language, um, or, you know, a, a, across disciplines. Uh, so whether we define women as not men or as the second sex, as de Beauvoir put it, whether we think of the binary as a kind of hierarchy uh, for, as, we, as we inherit from the entirety of Western thought, um, or as Catherine Malibu puts it in 2011, in Changing Difference, she says, 
that woman finds herself now in the age of post-feminism deprived of her essence only confirms paradoxically a very ancient state of affairs. Woman, she says, has never been able to define herself other than through the violence done to her. Malibu's proposal that we define woman as, quote, an empty but resistant essence, an essence that is resistance because empty, a resistance that strikes out the impossibility of its own disappearance once and for all, might remind us from the outset um, of Marx's, early Marx's formulation of a class with radical chains. Um, his kind of negative definition, and I think it's interesting that Alenka was talking about um, uh, almost defending uh, the idea of a, a, the negative or the lack in a psychoanalytic approach and not as something empty, not staring at the void, but rather as a kind of surplus as well. And, and you can see the kind of parallels perhaps with, between what Malibu is saying as a, an essence that is resistant because empty, right? And Marx's formulation of a class of radical chains and a state which Marx says is the dissolution of all estates. Okay, and that's early Marx's definition of the proletariat. Malibu's definition then is not a positive identification. It's not a question of identifying um, a group in a, in a positive way. Just as Marx's definition of the proletariat is not either. Um, obviously there's a huge caveat about making any analogies between women and the proletariat, um, is, which is a very stretched kind of analogy, um, other than at the level of a kind of negative uh, definition here. Malibu suggests that feminism today can be seen as a feminism without women. A paradox remains then. She says, if we name it, and she uses this word it, the feminine, if we incorporate the inviolable, and she takes that from Derrida, we run the risk of fixing this fragility, assigning it a residence and making a fetish out of it. If we resist it, she says, we refuse to embody the inviolable and it becomes anything at all under the pretext of referring to anyone. So this incredible tension then between a kind of negative um, definition or an empty definition and, and a definition of something which is without content in a certain way, the, the possibility of a fetishistic fixing um, or a kind of uh, excessively expansive uh, definition um, of, of a particular category. Uh, we're absolutely stuck in this um, position and it's a, 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 a kind of deep metaphysical, ontological, uh, political, social <laughs> question uh, and problem. I don't see what else it can be. And I mean, my instinct is to kind of be very uh, resistant to uh, a negative definition of the category of woman. I find it uh, difficult to accept um, that Malibu's definition of, of woman as uh, the category of being for whom violence is a central feature um, is, is anything other than kind of profoundly dispiriting, even though on some other level it describes uh, a reality um, as well. Um, so what is feminism, Malibu asks, if, if it involves eradicating its origin, woman? And later she says, the deconstruction of sexual identities does not imply letting go of the fight for women's liberation. Malibu's return to violence throughout this book, Changing Difference, I'm referring to, um, is kind of a, a refrain of hers. Woman is nothing anymore, she says, except the violence through which her being nothing continues to exist. Um, as I said, I, I can't help but see this as rather plaintive. Uh, I mean, however we can recategorize this question of the negative um, definition, whether we think of lack as also a surplus or the cut as also a, some kind of excess, um, I wonder if there is also a, another more joyful way in which we can uh, think about a kind of uh, a, a definitional uh, claim here. Um, Malibu nevertheless does think this, this definition of, of woman as uh, uh, defined as uh, through violence, she says perhaps it opens a new path that goes beyond both essentialism and anti-essentialism. What about essentialism? Um, this word, perhaps, uh, alongside words like nature, perhaps essentialism and nature are perhaps the two most off-limits words <laughs> that you can possibly evoke uh, in this discussion. 
in feminism um, and have been for a very long time. Um, I think we need to return uh, though, uh, however kind of uh, critically and, and uh, with as many caveats as possible to some of these, uh, these terms and to define what we mean by essentialism, whether we're talking about a formal definition or whether we're talking about something that then implies something else. You know, if you set a definition of something, does it mean that that thing must behave in particular ways, right? Obviously not. I'm going to return to this question later. I wanted to reference briefly uh, radical feminism and to point out a kind of uh, sort of perhaps interesting difference or tension in terms of the negative definitions of particular second wave movements. So somebody like Mary Daly, undoubtedly extremely unpopular figure today in many ways, in her book Gynecology, G-Y-N forward slash ecology, in which she attempts to try and think, rethink the history of women um, as part of nature in relation to nature and also in terms of the patriarchal kind of suppression of women and of nature and of goddess cults and all of these things. It's a book from 1978. When we talk about radical feminism, we're talking about getting to the root of the problem. We don't mean extreme feminism, we mean radix, its root. So for radical feminism, uh, the root of the problem or the question is patriarchy. From a Marxist point of view, this is obviously uh, potentially problematic because it seems to point to a kind of pre-historical origin of the roots of women's oppression. It doesn't, perhaps from a Marxist point of view, a Marxist feminist point of view, um, get to the specificity of forms of oppression in particular modes of production. Nevertheless, what does the radical feminist position in the form of Mary Daly say at this point in the late 70s? She says, we are unmasking deceptive patriarchal history, rendering it obsolete. She talks about a kind of suspicion all the way down, a positive paranoia, right? This kind of reading of patriarchal history. She talks about the deep and universal intent to destroy the divine spark in women. She talks about a patriarchal planet against a lost thread of connectedness within the cosmos, all of which um, would be seen by many as ex extremely essentialist uh, positions um, that point to a kind of uh, a very specific relationship between women and nature or a uh, discussion of female nature as such. In terms then of a kind of Marxist feminism then, and just to kind of try and draw out again this little, this tension really between a Marxist feminist approach and a radical feminist approach. And I'm sorry, this is a bit familiar, I'm sure, in these terms of these broad uh, differences. In Martha Jimenez's 2000 essay, um, she kind of positions various of these feminists approaches. So she talks about liberal feminism and undoubtedly we live in the kind of era of a certain kind of liberal or neoliberal feminism, whether we're talking about corporate feminism, CEO feminism, lean-in feminism, you know, that kind of compatibility of a kind of capitalist uh, feminism, if we even want to call it that, and, uh, uh, you know, uh, everyday, you know, sort of pro-work, pro-consumer existence, right? She, she talks then also of a radical feminism and her Marxist critique would be exactly as I've suggested, it's not um, historically precise enough. It doesn't uh, pin down uh, the specific ways in which women are categorized and oppressed in different modes of production. The radical feminist position is always pointing to uh, uh, a kind of um, almost intransigent uh, opposition between men and women uh, where patriarchy is this kind of uh, absolute inviolable <laughs> structure uh, in which women will always be kind of oppressed and men and women therefore are enemies. From a Marxist point of view, this doesn't make any sense. The men and women of the working class are in solidarity uh, and figures like um, Colin Ty and others would be absolutely significant in, in, in broaching this question of the solidarity between men and women in the early 20th century, uh, feminist and Marxist literature. Um, she's critical of socialist feminism. Um, perhaps it's not such in, uh, not really in the ascendancy uh, in the moment in Western speaking countries, um, perhaps. We end up in dual systems theory of patriarchy and capitalist oppression. 
She mentions post-structuralist and post-modern approaches. We could also add intersectionalist approaches today. Um, but Jimenez's focus, I just want to kind of briefly note, is on uh, Marxist feminism and the specific quality of uh, this approach in which uh, the material conditions for the production and reproduction of human life are addressed in a specific mode of production. And this a relationship between production and the reproduction of material life will of course address both biological and social uh, dimensions and the relationship between uh, the two. Um, and I think it's very interesting that Alenka um, reflected in great detail of the relationship between life and death at the level of uh, reproduction. And I'll return to that question of Eros and Thanatos um, in the question of the mother later on. Jimenez in this 2000 essay is critical of materialist feminism, which she wants to distinguish um, from Marxist feminism, as if we, we might usually conflate the two, perhaps a materialist approach is surely a Marxist approach. Uh, nevertheless, um, she's worried about materialist feminism. This is 20 years ago. I wonder where this would be situated now. She thinks that materialist feminism at that time, perhaps in ascendancy in the academy, is critical of Marxism's alleged economism, class reductionism, and suffers from a disregard for agency and the effects of culture and ideology. She's criticizing really what I think would be a kind of postmodern Marxist approach, perhaps a kind of Althusserian approach. Um, but it's interesting to reflect upon today how often this criticism, this claim of economism or class reductionism in particular, um, is, is being kind of, uh, I don't know, repeated today, let's say in the more popular discussions about the role of Marxism in today's uh, discourse or discussion. Um, and we can see the kind of limits of the relationship between a kind of uh, Marxist approach and an identitarian approach. Um, we're kind of dominated by this struggle, um, I would say, in many ways. And it's, it's forming a kind of gigantic kind of culture and political clash. Um, so Jimenez instead wants to focus on the capitalist sources of the oppression of women. She rejects the prehistorical notion of patriarchy um, and instead focuses on the specificity of capitalism in the interplay of production and reproduction of material life. Um, and in a sense, I don't see what else we can really do. Nevertheless, I would like to inflect this um, perspective uh, with the question of perspective itself, and this will be, the rest of my paper will be more psychoanalytic um, in a certain way, and I want to kind of introduce this question of parallax or perspective, which is not quite the same as the sort of standpoint epistemology point, I want to say, something kind of more, uh, more profound, perhaps, in a way. I'm going to define what I mean in a second. So parallax and this is a term that Zizek and others have used and taken um, in a particular direction. When we talk about parallax, it's when an object appears to change its position because the person or instrument has changed their position. So it's not simply a kind of claim about speaking from a particular position. It's a deeper uh, claim about positionality itself and, and how positionality itself operates. And this seems to me absolutely crucial if we're thinking about um, the question of, of sex and what it means to reflect deeply and profoundly philosophically and politically um, on what sex means today. Sex would seem on the face of it to be an obvious candidate for thinking about parallax or thinking parallaxically if we are talking about ways of seeing or places, positions to see and think from and also of positionality itself. We could say simply, perhaps too simply, that the world looks different depending on if you are a man or a woman. How it looks different or how we come to understand these terms, man or woman, as positions, whether biologically, linguistically, legally, existentially, and so on, is no doubt a profoundly complex matter. Recent years have seen extremely emotional and at times violent contestation over what these terms mean and who can claim them. Debates in the United Kingdom, but elsewhere too, over proposals, legal proposals, to change the meaning of sex from biological definition to self-identification 
have seen women in particular attacked for, for example, wanting to attend meetings to discuss these proposed changes to legislation. And many men and women especially have lost employment after being accused of holding transphobic positions, though the people accused of this would not accept that word as a definition of themselves. That is to say they have been attacked for saying that sex is real and that this difference has consequences and for disputing the idea that being a man or a woman is a matter of a feeling, for criticizing the idea that one can say one is a man or a woman because one feels that way. But what happens if we agree, we all agree collectively, socially, that sex isn't real? Or in other words, that sex is not how we decide who is a man or who is a woman. Amongst trans activists, sex is postulated as something that can be changed, either through a declaration or and or through surgical and chemical intervention. So we have perhaps two competing claims here. One, that sex is real, and the other, that sex is not real. Or perhaps that sex is not as real as something else, whatever that something else is, desire, image, fantasy, or feeling. It is obvious from this brief opening sketch that there is in contemporary life a serious and deep clash of positions here regarding what it means to be a man or a woman. What role has and what role can thought play in these turbulent times? Those who hold that male and female are realities that have distinct features are often criticized as holding essentialist positions. That is to say that commitment to the biological existence of two separate sexes must bring with it, this is the critical approach, or threatens to, ideas of how each sex should behave, i.e. men should behave in a masculine way women in a feminine way, um, for example, as some traditionalist religion, uh, religious positions that are also committed to the reality of, ex of sex might entail. It is, however, arguably possible, as many in the second wave did argue, to both be committed to the reality of biological sex on some basic level, but not be committed to the idea that any particular kind of gendered behavior follows from this acceptance. The doctor says it's a girl or it's a boy, but does not say how these facts should play out in each individual's lives. The acceptance of a biological basis to sex does not entail that boys or girls, men or women, should therefore behave in particular ways because of the fact that one is born male or female. In fact, we could say gender roles and stereotypes are precisely that which should be abolished both individually and collectively. As I say, this is broadly the position of, of much of second wave feminism. Um, which promoted the, the idea of the abolition of gender, where gender is perceived to be a kind of social construct, something negative coming from outside. Um, and we would associate this largely with the 1970s. Um, and I would say the effect of second wave feminism nevertheless did filter down in some kind of weakened way, um, though quite successfully into kind of education, educational ideas in the 1980s and 1990s in particular, um, and not just in education, in broader society, for at least these two or three decades. Um, so we, have a kind, we had a kind of idea of a sort of gender abolition, uh, that basically it didn't matter what sex you were, you, you should be able to behave and wear and love and, and do all the things that you wanted to do. I remember being told repeatedly that, that I shouldn't feel held back by the fact that I was a girl. Um, and we could say there was a kind of loosening of gender stereotypes, more freedom regarding dress, interest and behavior, including sexual behavior, i.e. just because one was a feminine boy or a man and attracted to other boys, for example, did not make that person a girl or a woman. And this is broadly, I would say, the second wave gender abolitionist approach. That was the conception of gender that we were working with for, for quite a long time, let's say the 70s to 90s at least. The psychoanalytic position, particularly in Lacan's work on feminine sexuality, comes at the question from a slightly different angle. As Jacqueline Rose puts it, Lacan does not refuse difference. If there was no difference, how could I say there was no sexual relation, says Lacan. But for him, what is to be questioned is the seeming consistency of that difference, of the body or anything else. The difference it enjoins, the definition of the woman it produces, it appears, therefore, as if there is more mystery in the psychoanalytic position, more flexibility. As Juliette Mitchell puts it, Freud's account of sexual desire led Lacan, as it led Freud, 
to his adamant rejection of any theory of the difference between the sexes in terms of pre-given male or female entities which complete and satisfy each other, the, the platonic model, or at least one of the stories in the symposium, the idea of a kind of fu sexual fusion. Sexual difference, Mitchell continues, can only be the consequence of a division or a cut in Alenka's uh, talk. Without this division, she said, it would cease to exist. But it must exist because no human being can become a subject outside the division into two sexes. One must take up a position as either a man or a, a woman. Such a position is by no means identical with one's biological sexual characteristics, nor is it a position of which one can be very confident as the psychoanalytic experience demonstrates. This profound uncertainty and ongoing ambivalence in relation to the inescapably sex nature of existence as recognized by psychoanalysis has nevertheless arguably shifted in the wider culture to a desire at times to completely dispense with the recognition of the originary different division or difference. Every signifier relating to sexuation just seems to float as a possible identity, a kind of consumerist or capitalist uh, form of identity that anyone can claim, which makes question the question of sex nothing other than a question of power. Who has the power to name? While it may have been expeditious at a certain point to criticize the sexual binary in the name of attacking the hierarchy of this binarism, the idea long-standing in Western thought in Aristotle and many others that the male is better than the female, for example, the attempt to eradicate the binary, now any binary, um, can be seen as perhaps ushering in or runs the risk of ushering in a new era of anti-feminism in which women's right to define themselves is once again eradicated or erased. And this has serious legal and social, political and interpersonal uh, consequences. So I want to address two neglected aspects of this question of sex. Firstly, in psychoanalysis, what I regard as the too quick slide between sexuation and sexuality as if the problem of sexual difference can be passed over by the invocation of desire. This is the parallax of sexuation and sexuality. And secondly, the relative neglect of the inheritance and history of second wave feminist theory in contemporary thought, particularly in the occlusion of the figure of the mother. Um, and let, us, let me note that no human being born today has yet been born without a mother, <laughs> despite the ambitions of many uh, for artificial wombs and so on. So sexuation, sexuality. So to be clear, in recent years, a new notion of gender has emerged, which is different from the second wave notion of gender as something to be abolished as a kind of negative social imposition that required that boys and girls and men and women behave in particular ways. This is what was trying to be eliminated. We could call this the feeling idea of gender. This idea has no necessary basis in biological sex, i.e. one can simply say that one is or identifies or feels that they are a woman or a man or neither for it to be true. What is the role or relation to psychoanalysis in this latter notion of gender as feeling? This idea of sex as assertion, where one says that one is simply a man or woman, that one simply is a man or woman, is troubled by the idea that one can never truly assert with such certainty that one is or is not anything at all. At the same time, psychoanalysis has troubled the idea of uncritical access to such a thing as biological reality, or the idea that there is a pre-linguistic space of bodies or desires that we can have any access to. Yet we live I would say in an everyday double bind when it comes to sexuation. We both believe and do not believe to some extent in the reality of sex. We both notice it and ignore it. Is sex therefore a transcendental condition for the possibility of, of knowledge, a kind of parallax um, that is also at the same time a kind of blind spot? Either in the sense that we see the world through the lens of sex, i.e. we see sex as if it is in the world and or that we see the world in a sexed way, i.e. from the standpoint of our own sex, consciously or otherwise. We could say that perhaps it is a transcendental condition in both of these senses. 
We thus both see sex and disavow it. There is no non-sex experience or knowledge. It is not possible for human beings to understand the world outside of sex. Even if there are various knowledges that do not pertain to sex as such, we could say mathematical truths are not male or female, for example, although this too has been contested by thinkers such as Lou Sirigaray, uh, for example, in her work um, on logic and, and fluid mechanics. It is possible to talk about the ways in which multiple things, language, discourses, disciplines, experience, history are sexuated um, to go back to uh, Mary Daly's kind of uh, positive paranoia, a way, you know, thinking about patriarchy as a kind of filter or lens to see the entire history of the relationship between men and women. It's possible, therefore, to talk about the ways in which these things are sexuated or are lived in a sex manner, which is something no living human being can exit from entirely. I think even in death, let's say, um, even if one's sex is always a problem or a question, let's say an incompletion, it's never a kind of finalized uh, definition. Psychoanalysis and its focus on desire often skips quickly from sexuation to sexuality, as if the latter realm is the only place in which the former is lived out. But sexuation is much more than how one relates to the other. Here we could take a much more existentialist approach, such as that found in Simone de Beauvoir. Woman, she says, is the most deeply alienated of all the female mammals, and she is the one that refuses this alienation most violently. In no other is the subordination of the organism to the reproductive function more imperious, nor accepted with greater difficulty. These biological data are of extreme importance. They play an all important role and are an essential element of woman's situation. And I think when people think about de Beauvoir today, they forget that she begins with this question of the biological specificity. It's a very uh, almost um, scientific start or near the start of, of the book. If we are to take seriously the idea that sex is a transcendental category of parallax or a transcendental condition for the possibility of knowledge, it would mean that A, not only is sex the condition for the possibility of knowing, but that also B, that seeing from these different perspectives, male and female, might be possible in a fused or dis disjunct way i.e. might be possible to see things from the male and female perspective or the male or female perspective. But is sex something that changes how we see everything? We can and do talk about human knowledge, knowledge of and for and gained by the species. But is this knowledge truly without sex? There is no third sex position, though there is neutral knowledge that does not depend on the sex of the person comprehending it. And just as an aside in the history of magic, the androgyne is an extremely powerful figure. The androgyne is somebody who can both stimulate the desire of men and women, uh, heterosexual and homosexual. The androgyne is a profoundly uh, important uh, alchemical uh, figure, but it's at the level of desire. It's the person who understands the desire of all of the others. So, sticking with sexuation, as Alenka Zupancic puts it in What is Sex? If one removes sex from sex, one removes the very thing that has brought to light the problem that sexual difference is all about. One does not remove the problem, but the means of seeing it and of seeing the way it operates. When Freud talks about human bisexuality in the 1905 edition of the three essays on the theory of sexuality, in discussing, quote, male inverts, that is to say, male homosexuals, Freud writes the following. Expressing the crudest form of the theory of bisexuality, a spokesperson for male inverts described it was a female brain in, in a male body. But we do not know what characterizes a female brain, says Freud. There is neither need nor justification for replacing the psychological problem with the anatomical one. What Freud identifies is a certain kind of temptation that it is possible to understand or be the opposite sex in relation to su sexual object choice. Thus, a homosexual man is like a woman because his object choice is the same as a heterosexual woman. And consequently, there is something anatomical which differentiates him from a heterosexual man. But this is too simple, Freud suggests. Even as we sometimes see a resurgence of this kind of thinking today, among some proponents of the transgender narrative, 
namely that it is possible to be, quote, born in the wrong body, or that male or female brains can exist in, in differentially male or female bodies. So what is the psychological, or for the purposes of this talk, transcendental problem of sex? If we take part of Hegel's criticism of Kant seriously, we should too historicize the question of sex. One of the major problems of today's technologically oriented transhumanist narratives in which is somehow imagined possible through drugs or surgery to transform material reality into a kind of wish fulfillment. What is left behind is the incomplete meeting of psychoanalysis and feminism. This can be seen, I think, particularly in the figure of the absence of the mother in much contemporary psychoanalytic discourse. And I think there's these kind of various quests for immortality of a kind of world without mothers, uh, of a world without uh, the ne necessity uh, for um, the mother maternal function are all kind of part of this um, tendency to occlude or obscure the reality of this position. And I think here second wave feminism both figures as the maternal discourse as in it's generationally old enough to be the conceptual mother of today's often infantilized discussions of sex um, but also as a set of questions and thoughts that properly pose the role and the significance of the mother and is now being obscured again, whether it be in kind of Silicon Valley um, fantasies about immortality or artificial wombs, or more broadly in a society that absolutely worships uh, youth um, and absolutely abhors uh, the mother. So this section is called uh, Parallax Mother. We're living through not just a period of extreme real and virtual misogyny, but also through yet another backlash against feminism, particularly against the kind of feminism that has something to say about sexual difference, sexual relation, violence, and patriarchy. Seen a certain way, this can be seen as a culturally and historically widespread attack on mothers uh, in, in general, though we might say too that the history of humanity is nothing other than an endless series of backlashes of one group against another, usually on the basis of misrepresentation and projection. I'm not here attempting to reduce womanhood to motherhood, nor womanhood, nor motherhood, to any kind of normative idea of what it would mean to be either of those two things, but to perhaps um, ask some open and general questions about what the relationship is between matricide, feminism, and memory, or the forgetting of second wave feminism and the occlusion of uh, mothers in particular might be. So here's second wave feminism. I'm not treating it as a kind of historical artifact, but rather as an approach and a series of approaches to the world that would include radical feminism, Marxist feminism in particular, as the most profound uh, approaches. And as an approach to the world that has its kind of political emphasis on women's liberation, um, that question of freedom, the freedom that was never ever going to be achieved in the capitalist inclusion of women either into the workforce or into capitalism's own image of what humanity is. And I would rather defend a feminism of absolute and abject failure than a feminism that sees its culmination uh, in the belonging of women uh, to capitalism. And I also want to pose this as a kind of social question about how men and women might live together which again is not without serious contention, um, particularly in the wake of Me Too, a generalized suspicion um, between the sexes and so on. The concern with matricide here is also about um, a process both of forgetting and murdering the insights of the second wave. I suspect we may need to come up with a somewhat piecemeal, fragmentary, funny and unfinished way of addressing the question of how we might live together. And behind all of this is what a psychoanalytically feminist theory of humour might be vis-a-vis -vis the question of sexual difference and about the possibilities for social relations between men and women. And perhaps this is slightly for another time. I've just been writing a book called What Do Men Want? Um, which proposes um, that we need to rethink uh, the kind of the forms of game playing that exist between men and women in order to uh, exist in a heterosocial world, which is to say a world in which men and women are mixed all the time. We do not, we don't live in a, a segregated world. We don't live in a separatist world. We live in a world in which men and women are uh, everywhere together almost all the time. 
um, and this has brought with it a uh, great many uh, forms of conflict, suspicion, concern, worry, anxiety, and so on. Um, and I asked this question almost in a humorous way of how we might uh, live together um, again. I would say that the truths of psychoanalysis, such as the truths of Freud's 1905 work and the truths of feminism, both seem to have suffered a similar fate in recent years skipped over, ignored, or imagined to be something else, generationally displaced, as if these disciplines did not ask the exact same question as humanity does of itself over and over again. And I think also the question of myth, it's very important to remember how distinctly and deeply Freud and Lacan and others draw upon uh, myth uh, in, in relation to thinking about the questions of, of men and women. So why here matricide feminism and memory? It strikes me that there are at least three main themes on different but related levels that initially come to my mind. And I want to just briefly introduce an important distinction between not forgetting on the one hand and remembering on the other. And this is a distinction that Alain Badiou brings up in his ethics. He writes the following. The concrete circumstances in which someone is seized by a fidelity an amorous encounter, the sudden feeling that this poem was addressed to you, a scientific theory whose initially obscure beauty overwhelms you, or the active intelligence of a political place, you have to have encountered at least once in your life the voice of a master. If it is true that, as Lacan suggests, all access to the real is of the order of an encounter, and consistency, which is the content of the ethical maxim, keep going, keeps going only by following the thread of this reel. We might put it like this, never forget what you have encountered, but we can say this only if we understand that not forgetting is not a memory. So I want to try to be faithful then to this idea of not forgetting, not forgetting is not a memory. But what have we encountered and what should we not forget? Especially when it comes to those things which are structurally forgotten most of all, which master are we talking about when it comes to mothers? And how can we even use this word in this way? The parallax optics on mastery and mothering cause a kind of short circuit from the start. The material circumstances of matricide should be noted here. The 2017 femicide census noted that 7.1% of the 113 women killed in England, Wales and Northern Ireland in 2016 were killed by a male family member i.e. a son, father, brother, nephew, or grandson. The report noted that some of the context for these killings could be contextualized under the heading of mercy killing or domestic child parent situations in news reports, for example. While matricide is relatively rare and currently only forms a small proportion of the total instances of femicide, most women are killed by their current or former partner and we should note that globally femicide is also performed at the level of hoiticide, where female fetuses are killed uh, before birth on the basis of using uh, scans. I don't know if it's still working. We might ask ourselves, therefore, whether there is a broader culture of animosity towards mothers without, of course, exempting ourselves from such murderous or at the very least ambivalent feelings towards our own mothers. We're all capable of violence and aggressivity, which is completely forgotten or sometimes forgotten in some of the discourses around Me Too or toxic masculinity, um, as if all men are somehow uh, always on the side of violence and all women somehow not. But violence is, of course, in actuality, uh, unevenly distributed when it comes to women and men. I think this is important. Women are not always, of course, on the side of passivity, nurturing and so on. The capacity to care is always and also the capacity to harm. But women historically and practically are the most immediate and obvious, obvious group targeted whenever resentment is expressed. As Jacqueline Rose puts it in her text, Mothers, an essay on love and cruelty, motherhood is in Western discourse the place in our culture where we lodge or rather bury the reality of our own conflicts of what it means to be fully human it is the ultimate scapegoat for our personal and political failings, for everything that is wrong with the world, which it becomes the task, unrealizable, of course, of mothers to repair. 
As Rose comments, one reason why motherhood is often so disconcerting seems to be its uneasy proximity to death. Rose's project in her essay and in any psychoanalytic account of motherhood that acknowledges this proximity to death must also therefore be a question of eros. And this already came up in a link of paper in a different way. Rose writes the following. Above all, whenever any aspect of mothering is vaunted as the emblem of health, love and devotion, you can be sure that a whole complex range of emotions of what humans are capable of feeling is being silenced or suppressed. Such injunctions wipe pleasure and pain, eros and death from the slate. Why, French psychoanalyst Jean Laplanche once mused, are there no artistic representations or any recognition in psychoanalytic writing of the erotic pleasure that a mother gains in breastfeeding her child, as if to say breastfeeding is okay, indeed obligatory, but not so okay is its attendant pleasure. The pleasure of the breastfeeding mother, perhaps represented on occasion only in religious portrayals of the Virgin Mary with Jesus at her breast, points to a deeper question of envy. The envy of women, of motherhood, of female pleasure in general is buried deep within our culture. It relates to the broader crisis of definition to the, relating to the term woman, as I've discussed above, which has implications for how motherhood does and doesn't overlap with this term woman. Not all women are mothers, but all mothers are women. Mothers are vital, obviously, <laughs> but constantly erased. The obscuring of the mother is part and parcel of the floating quality of the signifier woman. Many things cause problems here in an ongoing way, not least for me personally. <laughs> Maintaining the boundary of womanhood has always been difficult. Within psychoanalysis, woman is the not all. But in broader social life, it seems that womanhood is increasingly more or less completely permeable. It is a term up for grabs, as it were, a series of images and words open to everyone, but also strangely obscured. In recent years in the UK, we have, quite, we have had quite furious public debates over, for example, the use of the term non-men by the Green Party in 2016 as a term to include both women, trans women and non-binary people. The term men, we should note, was not changed to become non-women. With the group Green Party Women suggesting that, quote, as a whole, women are happy with terms such as non-men to be used. Update, they are not. More recently, there has been anger over changes in the language used around the body, with Cancer Research UK tweeting that, quote, cervical screening or the smear test is relevant for everyone aged 25 to 64 with a cervix. In March 2017, popular feminist writer Laurie Penny asked on Twitter, someone tell me, what's a short and non-essentialist way to refer to, quote, people who have a uterus and all that stuff? An online forum based in the UK called Not Unimportantly Mumsnet, with over 12 million visitors per month, has many members who have similarly reacted with intense anger over suggestions that they cannot refer to women by using the definition adult human female. By merely discussing this question at all at the moment, it becomes almost impossible to, be, to avoid being positioned on one side or another, a kind of imposed parallax. But from a psychoanalytic and philosophical point of view, we might well ask some difficult questions regarding how biological sex is functioning or not functioning in these discussions and why woman rather than man has become such a contested term in recent years at the level of the social political. Why didn't the Green Party, for example, start talking about non-women to refer to men, um, but rather was happy to talk about non-men? In his 1938 work on the family, Lacan writes the following, biological kinship. Another completely contingent similarity is the fact that the normal components of the family, as they are seen in our contemporary Western world, father, mother, and children are the same as those of the biological family. This identity is in fact nothing more than a numerical equality. We know that emphasis on, or rather a reduction to the biological or biologism is completely antithetical to an understanding of the symbolic order. And this is what Elenka was saying of our entry into language. But there is nevertheless a crisis of identity at the heart of some of these often extremely fraught, fraught debates. Or let's say identity has displaced some of the questions 
um, in, a, in a very peculiar way and perhaps a way that people didn't foresee uh, coming. And then this goes back to the question of the relationship then between the symbolic and capitalism. What is happening in some of these questions about identity and how they're playing out in the political and social spheres. We seem to have moved from an understanding of identity that accepts that all identity is constructed in a complex negotiation with oneself and others and with broader social conditions. The idea then in the first place of gender one, let's say, gender as a social imposition that was uh, proposed to be abolished by the second wave to something like an extreme position on social perception in which a demand is made in the first place of the other, that the other recognize the person demanding whatever they say they are. So the identitarian position becomes then a sort of almost narcissistic demand that doesn't in the first place incorporate a kind of negotiative or a kind of complex social uh, relation between the one and the other. We could say that today we have something like a battle between, on the one hand, a kind of tautological identity formation in the form, I am whatever I say I am, and a pure social constructivism in the form, I am whatever you say I am. This has important political consequences. A purely self-referential identity that operates outside of social perception is likely to lead to, amongst other things, serious cognitive dissonance in that you can't control how other people see you necessarily. It's impossible to, uh, to force uh, a reading or reception of you, um, however uh, fantastical you might want it to be. But on the other hand, a pure social constructivism might lead to political despair, something like I'm merely the sum of other people's perceptions and cannot change. Um, and I think that kind of very complicated yeah, indeed, like uh, relationality, a dialectic between self and other has somehow become uh, inordinately uh, complicated and enormously painful for almost everybody, um, particularly perhaps for younger people um, who uh, might feel compelled to, to even have an identity. What does it mean to even kind of assert that one is X? Um, this is a very, um, uh, a very problematic position actually, but now one that is incredibly dominant, um, the idea that one must flag up one's identity uh, every moment. So I think psychoanalytically and philosophically, we have to ask this really hard question of how the, the social and the individual relate um, and how that is, uh, you know, relates as a, in a palimpsest kind of way to the question of sexuation uh, and whether we want to keep these terms male and female and what operations they are performing. Uh, what complexities they're introducing, um, how this relates to the history of feminism. We might want to suggest that historically uh, those categorized as women would have found it extremely difficult to identify out of that position, the idea that one could simply assert that one shouldn't be treated in such a way because one didn't identify as a woman would have been absurd uh, for the vast majority uh, of human history. We, we need to ask again how the biological and the psychic are intertwined, how they relate uh, to one another. If biology is not destiny, uh, what role does it serve? Um, do we still need to keep these terms? Without reducing this kind of intertwining to one side um, or, or another, how do we keep these discourses open? I think I want just to conclude by saying that sex, as in sexuation rather than sexuality, is constitutively a problem for every living being and dying being and dead being <laughs> and every being who ever lived or every undead being as well. There is no way out of this, I think, no matter how much we would like to wish it um, otherwise. Um, we see the world from the standpoint of being a man or a woman, whatever similarities or differences there might be between us, however much these positions change and develop during the course of history, we're all in another sense, modern subjects or postmodern subjects or whatever you would like to say, that question of how much the subject then comes to uh, swallow up dialectically uh, sexuation is another question we could ask. I think it's not enough to skip over however much we, we might want to, 
to skip over sexuation in favour of sexuality. I don't think we can simply displace the question of sex onto the question of desire. It's not a question of uh, uh, how we feel about others in that way at all, whether we feel desire. Whatever the difference between men and women might be, I think it is imperative for the collective sanity of humanity as a whole that we have an open and social discussion about it and that people aren't punished um, for holding different lines uh, on this question, however kind of uncomfortable and painful uh, this discussion is. Um, and I think we have to hold firm to the fact that there is a difference, however it is lived out, whether we describe it in terms of a kind of cut or a differentiation, whether we say that this cut then uh, plays out in terms of these uh, particular words like man or woman, whether we want to change what those words mean, whether we collectively agree that this has political or social implications. These are not questions for, for small numbers of people to answer. These are questions I think um, that everybody has to think about and must think about um, collectively. So I'll leave it there. Well, I just wanted to ask since um, there was a lot of talk about uh, essentialism versus gender as this kind of a feeling or self-identification. Um, I wanted to ask since uh, lately, especially in the Balkans, uh, there has been this uh, huge schism in feminism, let's call it that, uh, between uh, the proponents of essentialism and the notion of gender as self-identification, which seem to uh, look at each other as uh, mutually exclusive. And I was wondering, um, in practice, do they necessarily need to be so? Because, well, um, also because practice uh, largely differs from theory in a lot of cases simply because uh, it's it cannot it cannot be as planned as theory can be as if, if you get what I'm trying to say so uh, do they need to be mutually exclusive are they even mutually exclusive and in which ways in practice the notion of essentialism and gender as self-identification can be reconciled since in a sense they both work on challenging the notion of what a woman is and is supposed to be within the patriarchal framework. I hope my question is clear. Yeah, um, I think I think so. Um, I mean you would you would hope that they didn't need to be kind of so oppositional. I mean I think what I was trying to say at the end is, is that there, there should be a kind of collective open social discussion about all of the implications. You know, if we collectively decide as a, as a humanity, you know, to make these kind of legal shifts, then it, they have to be something that everybody kind of agrees with, or it has to be a kind of form of negotiation, you know, that it's, it's not simply a kind of uh, imposition or an assertion that, that one, feels this therefore it must be the case you know I mean this also relates I think more generally to the the relationship between the private and the public or between fantasy life and social life you know between the psychoanalytic and the political you know that that it's it's we can't live collectively if it's merely a question of of um people imposing <laughs> fantasies on the social you know that that's that's actually in a way a kind of um I don't know, it's, it's going to, to cause a kind of, uh, I don't know, like a, well, maybe a plague of fantasies, as Zizek would have put it a long time ago, you know, that we're going to end up living in a kind of uh, a very complicated dream world um, that is composed of, of a sort of myriad of desires. I mean, I think, you know, to, to be more pragmatic, I mean, there are clearly uh, places in which this question has a, a relevancy. And I, I think there's a kind of obvious distaste for talking about the pragmatic or the empirical that a lot of academics or theoretical people have as if the abstract discussions uh, not only have a relation to the empirical or the political or the social uh, and in fact I think as we've seen in recent years they actually have a causal relation you know I think something like Judith Butler's or a miss reading or a semi reading of Judith Butler's understanding of gender has had a serious uh, empirical social uh, repercussions 
So, I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of obvious that if you change the definition of a concept in legal terms that it will have um, social implications. Um, they may be not what we expect, right? They may be different, but I think, you know, if you, let's say, you know, want to say that anyone can identify as any sex, you know, this clearly does have implications for where those spaces, where spaces and things were divided previously by sex. It's simple, you know, and, and that there are, you know, questions and, and things to be asked about that because the implications are very serious. And uh, what would be, um, if we would make those kinds of changes, uh, which factors would be relevant in determining uh, which changes we are, which changes are okay to make and which are not? Since it's again, it's much different to speculate in theory than it is in practice where certain decisions greatly impact people's lives. So like, what would be the defining criteria? What, I mean, there probably isn't a clear cut answer, but I would just like to hear some different opinions. Yeah, I, I mean, I think as a, as a, at least as a political method, then, you know, the old fashioned ones of dialogue and, and, you know, perhaps not kicking out all of the women in your party who might suggest that women's sports and, and prisons and, and so on, you know, might have some relevance to women's lives might be a good idea. I mean, like, you know, like, <laughs> I think, <laughs> you know, there, there is, yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, I mean, it's, it just seems really basic. I mean, I, I do, I do think it's been disastrous the way in which this discussion, I don't think the discussion needed to proceed like this in the past few years. And I think it's been, you know, absolutely abhorrent that women have been um, described as uh, having hateful views when they don't, you know, that, that women, especially not only women, men too, but have been really punished for, for asking what are quite, you know, reasonable questions, you know. So, I mean, I think in the first place, it has to be a political, it's almost a question of method. What is a political method, you know? And we should, you know, I think respect differing viewpoints, something that's also a, a much broader mm -hmm. political problem these days you know, in which people have become incredibly divided on ma many, many political issues. Um, and this has had huge implications for friendship as well. Um, you know, and I think our notion of friendship has needs rethinking as well or resurrecting. But yeah. Thank you. Hi again, um, Patricia. Uh, uh, and now, uh, Nina, I really was enjoying both of it's the only talks that I was able to to follow, and Nina, really great to see you again. I'm afraid my mind only have half functions today. Uh, I'm full of other things and other matter, but still, uh, I think I can uh, simply say that uh, I agree like almost with everything you said. I mean, or even I could say everything you said. I would perhaps put some things uh, in a slightly different way, uh, but I think it is. Uh, I would just perhaps use this opportunity to try to clarify, to engage in a dialogue with you, so as also perhaps to clarify some of the things that uh, I hope and that I was trying to say before. So the, the polemical um, question that you started with, uh, I think I very much share, and I think we all share this kind of, or lots of us, this kind of frustration of precisely feminism being caught between these two things, uh, kind of clearly stating what it is to be a woman. Is there, you know, you can say a, a woman or is there only a negative way, uh, even if this negative way then amounts to some kind of, uh, not really definition, but some kind of concept. Is it possible to kind of uh, think, now we are kind of trying to think about it, of women in any other way that conceptually, uh, or is are there some kind of, uh, Obviously, this does relate, and it always does to certain empirical things and situations. But still, I cannot, and this is not at all to, as a mean remark, because I know I'm a, a, myself at loss here and keep struggling with this, and I'm very aware of this abstract sounding insistence on, on negativity. Uh, uh, in the final account, uh, also the concept of parallax is something like, like this, you know, it, because precisely from, it's not a parallax, and I know that you know that, it's not simply 
uh, two different points of view within the same system, uh, it also involves a certain very important asymmetry. It's also that the notion of asymmetry is very important. Why, why it is, this is precisely why otherwise we could just change perspectives, my, and we have get, got, get the whole picture. But this is not the way to get the whole picture. And I think a very good uh, example of parallax is one that uh, um, Zizek steals from Levi Strauss, you know, this famous uh, uh, anthropologist enterprise where they asked a tribe to, uh, to picture, to draw uh, the architectonic, the, the, the image of their village. And uh, one part draw it like in concentric circles and the other one like divided in half or something like this. And the point that uh, Levi Strauss makes is not that now we just look from above and we see like take the picture of how the village really looks like and we will get some kind of objective uh, uh, it, it is something third of course the problem is that the truth uh, the structure of this village is precisely the parallax view that uh, came out of this two things so this is absolutely fundamental and I, I guess this is what I was trying to kind of get to with this uh, idea of a cut which is coincide with sexuation, mm -hmm. but it's not yet applied in sexuality. In this, I mean, it is uh, sexuality is part of it, but it's, so I, I, if this was any kind, I didn't want to skip over sexuation, sexuality, rather the other uh, uh, way around. But anyway, I think the, the uh, uh, parallax, I think it's a very useful way precisely. And you know, this image that Lacan draws in a three, men, women, like toilets, and just these two letters on the floor, and what is, and he actually uses there, it's almost the same word that you see, you, you, you see the word very differently if you enter this door, <laughs> I mean enter, if you look from this door or from that. And I'm not see, uh, speaking about this question, politics of toilets and stuff, but simply the fact that there is, there seems to be uh, this kind of fundamental, um, Divergence there, and that it is important to address it, and not think that if you if you just stop uh, saying it, uh, it will go away because it does cause all kinds of problems. It has caused all kinds of problems also for women, also safety. But the way to tackle with it, it's not to just say, okay, now we will change the term sexual difference for the term multiplicity of genders, and the world will be great and happy again. I, I really, this is I think what we are. So, uh, and then you kind of introduce the motherhood as a kind of one, for instance, one of the concrete examples. And of course, for me, as you pointed it out, it's again, it's very interesting because it brings in via Jacqueline Rose this uh, uh, connection or this asymmetry, this uh, proximity to, uh, to death there in the sense of, you know, uh, um, so it, it, it's an interesting, um, but at the same time, you mentioned this surplus pleasure of feed, breastfeeding, which is a kind of a, so here we enter somehow sexuality and a different way in which sexuality has. So I, I think it is a real deadlock. And I think because it is a real, lock, real deadlock, it is all the more imperative that we keep it in our, our life and not try to perhaps uh, uh, simply uh, yeah, resolve it. So I very much agree with what you said. And just another remark, which is not direct, I mean, it's related to your talk, uh, but it struck, struck me as interesting that the way you described radical feminism, and I think you described it quite correctly, uh, with all its uh, um, whatever polemics with Marxism, that at somehow, at some level, it is radically Marxist in one sense, namely that in the sense that in the same way that sexual difference or divide is for radical feminism something that goes beyond simply cultural whatever uh, and that there is something that can kind of uh, uh, determines uh, the very uh, symbolic we live in you can say that this is what for marx the the class struggle it's, it's something that is, it's an antagonism which is there and which is not uh, simply and uh, it cannot be reduced to the struggle between different classes. I think that there are, there are all these classes and they're struggling for among themselves from whatever prevalence, but it is precisely the way in which the asymmetry of the very space of classes 
this structure. And this is what class struggle is about. So this is also why I, I think there have been this kind of a both consonances and dissonances between radical feminism and Marxism because of a certain proximity in a way, and at the same time, the place supposedly was already taken by the other concept. But I think this is also, uh, I prefer to think of this uh, as a true proximity and as something that uh, uh, one still needs to work out for how exactly this is, but something like this. Okay. So I will... Yeah, no, um, thank you, Elenka. I mean, I, yeah, I, I, that's really good um, set of comments. Um, I mean, yeah, I mean, I guess in like a Firestone, you have the attempt to talk about sex class in which he tries to say that like sex class is deeper than Marx, Marx's description of class, you know, that the, 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 the biological asymmetry between men and women, she says, is deeper than, yeah. than class in the... No, but know. the same Marx would say that class difference is deeper than class. I mean, I yeah. think this is already, it's the mode of production that it's not simply you have class, yeah. But so I think it's... A, to some extent, it's a sim uh, not similar argument. Yeah, no, exactly. And I, I mean, I think this, I mean, just one comment on the asymmetry of the parallax, yeah. you know, I, which, I, which I, I completely agree. And I, and I think it's, it's, yeah, I mean, in a sense, it's both a deadlock <laughs> and this kind of keeping open these questions at the same time. Like, you know, my, my resistance, I suppose, to the, the asymmetry when it's understood negatively is because, of course, you know, I mean, the history of Western thought, you know, of course, from Aristotle onwards at least is, you know, that the, 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 any binary division is always a hierarchy, right? So, like, you know, I mean, how do we overcome this, uh, the, the, the idea that if there, are, there is a binary that, that there always must be an opposition, that there always must be like a hierarchy and so on. So I think, I think and obviously I understand what, Malibu and, and de Beauvoir are doing and, and you also in a different way, but you know, to kind of um, absolutely uh, give a positive value to the negative almost, <laughs> if I can put it like this, is too too fast. But um, to say that, you know, there is a kind of like the, the beauty of the nothing, right, in Malibu, like the idea that that nothing is a position of resistance. Um, you know, that to have a position beyond essentialism and non-essentialism is is in fact a site of resistance you know and of course even to kind of remain in binary thinking how, how can we even do that in the age of uh, zeros and ones you know i mean <laughs> but of course we're completely structured by it too but i mean i i have a whole problem with the zero but that's another thing but um like yeah how do, how do i put it i don't know i mean maybe it's 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 it's, it's uh so on some level, not even, I can't even articulate it as a philosophical position, my resistance to a negative definition, even if that negative is itself not negative, right? It, it's a, it has a very yeah, concrete life. I think it's a negative that has very concrete life, and this is precisely what we are yeah, yes. discussing. But, yeah. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. I find this, uh, from your talk, quite provocative, I must say. Um, mm -hmm. Because, um, so there are a few few questions that I have and a few problems, I guess. And uh, one of them pertains to this kind of insistence upon this kind of biological specificity and this kind of reality of sex as that which cannot be disavowed, that, that is there, right? And um, my sense is that, like, I understand very, very well this kind of concern with not punishing uh, women who kind of make Things that are uh, can be classified as transphobic um, from certain perspectives, but the, in my view, the kind of insistence upon like there is a biological difference and it is what it is, it it produces an exclusion practically and like theoretically from um, of other realities, right? That of trans people and. Um, as we know from, I don't know, like from the history of the second wave feminism, it has too been accompanied by struggles of um, kind of black women uh, and the, their, their um, problematization of a homogenous understanding of what a woman is. So the posing men and women as homogenous categories in that kind of like basis upon which we kind of start uh, from, I think, has already been sh shown that it is it can be very violent and very exclusionary in itself. 
So, like, and that was kind of one one point, and the other was that I mean, I don't, I'm not particularly well versed in psychoanalysis, but if I understood the language of Anshish point correctly, this kind of insistence upon a difference or um, what was a division um, in her reading of Lacan was precisely to say it is not uh, to divide the human pieces into separate pieces, but that kind of division happens at another level. But that by displacing this, you create that kind of abstraction, you could say, that then um, functions to, in my view, in quite a violent way, by kind of excluding uh, different ways of kind of, I don't know, relating to sex. And, and like last point, because yesterday I did try to use, like to talk about humor and parody as well, and um, thinking about a humorous feminism, in my view, would be one that finds that uh, binary uh, ridiculous and laughs at it. Because if we take the binary as that kind of abstraction that can be rendered concrete in the act of humor, in, in the act of kind of um, making it to make. So I don't know, maybe the uh, Vanchish can say something about this, but that's how I understood the critical potential of humor. So a feminism that takes that kind of yeah division as an immutable one, I think can be quite uh, quite dangerous and exclusive. I mean I would I would simply say at the level of when we're discussing concepts, I mean to differentiate one concept from another, I mean do you think that all of those forms of differentiation are violent? I mean is language violent that in that way? language that postulates that reality is what it is, and that it is violent. But I mean, we when we differentiate one thing from another, we're giving it a definition. We're not saying, therefore, that it has to behave in any way. I mean, like the kind of minimal definition, like let's say a woman as adult human female, tells you nothing about what it means to be female, what it means to live. Because, because her point about in her in her work about sex and gender was precisely to show that sex is also discursively constructed, so they are not uncoupled. Like sex and gender, no, you cannot postulate one thing as this basis upon which you then just reduce gender to a behaviorist activity and like the kind of rendering of uh, the so-called trans gender narrative, as you called it, as this self-referential uh, identification. That's just, I, I think that's a very kind of unjust way of presenting the like, kind of position of trans I mean, if, if these things are so playful, what's at stake in saying that someone is one thing or another? I mean, if they're so open. The reality is at stake. The reality is. People. Indeed. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yes. So, whose reality takes precedent? It just becomes a question of power. It's a question of the assertion of what words mean, right? It's like the Humpty Dumpty theory of language. It's not, no, it's not. It is. <laughs> it's about, it is about alliances. I mean, we need to make alliances. Sure. I mean, I'm absolutely um, on board with that. I think recognizing structural problems and working out where people share, you know, similar forms of oppression is absolutely correct. Exactly, exactly what we need to do. But then that can't also be at the same time a division within that question of violence, right? It can't be kill all turfs, right? It can't be accusing people of hatred that they don't feel. You know, this is an incredibly divisive discussion that's happening. And I think it's absolutely, it would be incoherent to pretend that it's not happening. If you want to say that there is violence at the level of language, which there absolutely is, it's within this discourse as well. Yeah. And it's against women who are saying, who are asking reasonable questions, who are, are saying, look, we need to talk. We need to have dialogue. And other people are saying, no, shut the fuck up and threatening violence. Seriously. Yeah, I understand. But like, it's not about like some kind of interiority. I don't know how other people, if, if they really feel hate or not. That's not the point. But it's the same kind of argument that you can make about racist discourse and say, well, people are just not sure. 
and they are um, they're asking legitimate questions. But at some point, you need to also stand up and say, well, yes, we do need conversations. We, need, we do need that kind of engagement. But there is also something at stake here. Like, it's not, it's not just, I don't know. Yeah. It's an emotional discussion. I mean, it's a question of collective reality, right? It's a shared world. We all live in this world. Yeah. You know. I, I want to ask uh, your opinion about the connection between uh, radical feminism and Marxist feminism that we have covered already partly. Mm -hmm. um, I am kind of familiar with uh, how radical feminists tend to um, uh, um, like um, re reduce their their critic and analysis to patriarchy without uh, including critic of capitalism or, or, or fast society and, and things like that. And uh, they even sometimes turn to um, essentialism and uh, tend to say that men are inherently bad and things like that. So I'm familiar with that. And but I noticed that you said that um, you, you mentioned uh, Marxist um, feminism and uh, radical feminism as two different things. So is it your opinion that there is no uh, reconciliation between the two? Um, because when you go to classics like Engels, he says uh, the first division of labor is between men yeah. and women, and it was, it was historical defeat of women. So if you if you go this way, then you see that maybe genders emerged from the division of labor. So then you can be then you actually need to be Marxist in order to be gender critical. So there is this link between uh, radical mm -hmm. and Marxist. I think even necessary link. That, that's my opinion. Yeah. I want to hear yours. Um, I wasn't sure what is it yeah. your opinion or you just say how it is. No, I mean I th it's more complicated. I think I agree with you. I mean I think it's the you know actually my characterization of radical feminism was also unfair. I mean I actually think we have a very weird superficial like neoliberal version of some of the elements of radical feminism today, which is the simple like uh, media encourage hatred of men. Like it's really weird. You get the kind of like hatred of men thing one-sided but yeah, yeah it completely one-sided like without any kind of historical analysis whatsoever yeah. just yeah. the idea that like men are inherently bad or something and this is a kind of very common mm -hmm. like media very superficial media narrative right and it's encouraged so it's very weird actually like the afterlife of a certain part of a image of radical feminism is now somehow part of a kind of neoliberal media supposed feminist narrative as well anyway this is just a side note um but no, I mean, it's, you know, in all, in all seriousness, I mean, there is a sense in which, you know, absolutely, like the, the, the relation or the order of the identifying the origin of patriarchy and the origin of capitalism is completely, like, inextricable. I mean, and, and for any kind of serious, um, you know, feminist thinking of the second wave, I mean, it, it's, a, it's a way of uh too superficially characterizing in fact the relation between the two and there is i mean there's so many things i couldn't talk about in the time but you know i mean the question of of i mean separatism would one be as a but as a political strategy or so, like very minimal part of feminism but again has been seen to characterize you know particular tendency um but well, you know go on. sorry what they see as a problem is there is this division between, between radical feminism and liberal feminism yeah and radical feminism tends to criticize liberal feminism but it, in the end, because they lack a historical approach, they're also liberal. <laughs> they, they also have a sort of liberal liberal approach. Yeah, they which belong is, to, to this paradigm. Uh, no, exactly, which is why paradoxically, then you can have these little portions of, of it in neoliberalism, right? Like the, yeah. the, the men hatred thing, yeah. <laughs> you know, perhaps. Um, yeah. No, and I, I mean, I think historically, you know, one of the most important things to, to, to think about from a historical materialist point of view is precisely, you know, this we how is it possible to retroactively confer a different historical reality on the, the lived historical reality of women as a class right it's not possible to say like if only women could identify out as being women you know then they wouldn't have been then it would have been fine right this is just simply not true right so then you have to say well at a certain point identification becomes possible right why because of technology because of like transformation in language or the social you know, do you see what i mean like you know, so so the idea that these are kind of uh, these historical materialist accounts of the reality of production and reproduction on the basis of you know the construction and the oppression of a class, which which absolutely has to do with 
uh, biology, with the invention of the family, with the invention of like who does oh, what work, private property. private property, you know, the idea that somehow this is like an old story that no longer has any relevance can't possibly be correct. But can it get old, this story? I mean, this is just some historical fact. How can it get yeah, old? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. I yeah. mean, it's a historical reality. So, yeah. you know, then the, the, the question has to be at what point do we, you know, stop, you know, somehow is it possible that there's a new way of telling a story, you know, like it has that kind of consumed the old way of telling a story, which seems to make a lot more sense, but. Yes, in this postmodern world, like I, I see you include some Marcuse in your work, probably Herbert Marcuse. He, yeah. His work. Yes, this situation in postmodern world where, where nothing is, not, nothing is so obvious like it was in Marx's time. So it's very hard to distinguish what, what, is, what is reality and what is. But this is why I think like someone like Mary Daly and her kind of positive paranoia, like really has a point, you know, <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, like yeah, the yeah, suspicion. Yeah. I mean, it's absolutely a perspective. It's a way of seeing things, you know. Yeah, this concept of motherhood is something that I see as practitioner, not theoretician. Uh, I see this uh, mother notion of motherhood very important for the for feminist as political for feminism as political struggle in the context of of what you put as uh, implication in the empirical empirical and, and practical uh, level because this uh, link between theoretical debate. And uh, its uh, causal relation to, to, to practice is, is something that we, I, as practitioner, experience all the time. Uh, my question that is coming up all the time over a few couple of, of years uh, is how come that we we are so obsessed with defining what woman is. Something that was like <laughs> um, taken for granted as, as a notion uh, to be used in policy context, in political context, in practice and everything. So do you have any explanation based on your background <laughs> that that is my uh, <laughs> difficult question what do you think how come we came to this point that we cannot you know discuss women as something that is not necessary essential category but uh, uh, operative category mm -hmm. to deal with and to speak about in relation to something yeah. How come we, we came to a position to define women only and not men? All the time. Yeah. And in my opinion, this is the point when we uh, divide ourselves uh, currently in, in, the, in the discussion what should be legitimate notion of. Uh, of women as, as operative category, not to be content with it. Because the empirical data shows that persons who are called women are oppressed, struggled, <laughs> and have different consequences for different categories of the class women, as, uh, as you said. Yeah. I will give just an example. Violence as a common problem for all women uh, have different uh, consequences when it is done uh, against biological, what is called biological women, and for example, trans women. Material consequences are might be different, so mm -hmm. it requires maybe different strategies and different measures to deal with common problems in a different way. Maybe this is the common point of of uh, making, uh, of confronting violence by different groups based on the consequences, different con consequences that uh, different categories of women 
our experience. I mean, I think I think it's a really really difficult question is to say why this this word has become so contested. But I mean, I think we have to acknowledge that historically, and I mean, Elenka mentioned obviously in a in a real sense how. Um, relatively recent women's entry into political life, right, conceived of as, you know, the political sphere has been, I mean, you know, like between 50 and 100 years, right, let's say, in, in like advanced countries, quote unquote, you know, I mean, it's different in different parts of the world, but the, you know, the uh, women's suffrage is really about like 100 years old, for example, in the UK. And I think, you know, one thing that I've been thinking about is precisely you know, what happens to women when they disagree in the political sphere. Like, I mean, I saw this happen in the left too. It was like men loved left women when they agreed with them. You know, they were very happy to have <laughs> female comrades if women agreed with them and or they were fuckable, right? Like, this is like, <laughs> Sheila Robotham makes this point too. It's like, you know, men love lefty women in that sense, right? But the moment they sort of start saying, well, hang on, can we talk about this? Or we disagree with you on this? And they become like a real problem. And like, there's been serious, serious problems with misogyny uh, on the left and you know, on the right too. I mean, in politics, I mean, it's a kind of, it seems to me a constitutive problem. Like women's mass entry into politics has, has and, and always would have been troubled. I mean, this is the kind of like wager of modernity in a way. It's one of the wages. It's like, if we collectively decide as men and women how to live together, it's not necessarily going to be harmonious in the process and the method of discussing what that means. You know, no one ever said it was going to be easy, right? You know, and, and the, the separation, I mean, let's go back to the Greeks. I mean, like the separation of like the oikos and like the polis, you know, was divided along the lines of sex and also on, in terms of slavery as well. I mean, you know, it was a particular class of men that had political being right that existed as political beings once we say that everybody is a political being or well, everyone over a certain age i mean children have rights too but like they're not you know, can't vote you know so on i mean this this is a different set of questions right and i think it's not an answer proper answer i think there are lots of things going on i think also the virtualization of identity is a huge part of this problem the idea that there's people can detach who they, they think they are, the fantasy question from who they are, you know, and, and in one realm exist as a kind of, uh, I don't know, an avatar and in another exist as a body, you know, like the, the mind-body split has become a kind of technological performance every day, you know, or a question. I don't know. I mean, I think there are lots and lots of reasons. I mean, there are kind of lots of agendas going on too. I mean, whether they're kind of medical agendas or like, you know, phantasmatic agendas, you know, I mean, all of these things are kind of clashing you know, in a kind of collapsing and almost apocalyptic way. So, I mean, I don't know, it's not really like a positive answer really, is it? <laughs> Sorry. Uh, I do believe in a, a feminism that includes trans women as well. Uh, I do believe that uh, such struggle is possible. I uh, have no recollection that Nina ever denied that uh, possibility in her uh, writings. Another, uh, but let's see, I mean, let her uh, speak for herself. I, uh, I'm not sure to speak on her behalf. I wanted to uh, uh, build on your comment that um, declaring what reality is, is violent. And it, it can be violent. Uh, yeah, if uh, what the one who declares what's real and what's not real have true political power then uh, yeah the consequences are violence so but uh those who contest for example um uh, the epistemology i would say to me that that's epistemology gender constructivism or constructivism is merely epistemology those who contest this epistemology may uh cause some violent consequences, even though they do not intend to. Uh, but the other side as well, the other side who says sex is not real, it does not exist, and no further discussion. If you discuss this issue, then you're a reactionary. That's also violent. Because th that's also passing a, 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 a metaphysical judgment and declaring it the sole truth. It's, near to, you know, medieval uh, legislating of what's real and what's not real. So 
if what you said is uh, correct, but uh, one should call out the other side as well on the same uh, count. Yeah, that's uh, one thing. The other thing is uh, my position vis-a-vis uh, -vis this uh, whole dilemma that uh, Nina raised and triggered the entire discussion is, you know, completely experimental and might sound uh, silly, but if we are um, radicals enough uh, uh, in, uh, as materialists, uh, as uh, Marxists, uh, would, it, would it be a strategy for us to move away completely from the uh, ground of the postmodern battle uh, over, uh, of hegemony over language mm -hmm. and simply do not uh, give up on this fight for identity recognition. I would have absolutely no problem to be identified as a, a uterus carrying being well, and whatever that thing is. Uh, <laughs> never, I said it's, I know it's silly and I'm experimenting here, but uh, Allowing that exposes the violence toward me, and on the other hand, uh, gives me the possibility to frame my struggle in, uh, in materialist terms, uh, and in terms of my materialist concerns. So I'm pushing this mm. too far, you know, we're playing. I know what you're doing. We're playing <laughs> with ideas. Yeah. But how about that? Very interesting as always, Katerina, and I respect you philosophically and personally intensely um, as, as always I I think one of the major it's a very it's a very interesting wager what you propose I think one of the issues always with well this discussion is I mean it's a very emotional one it's for everybody it's very hard to talk about it in a, a, a non-passionate way or dispassionate way um, and I that, that aside, but I think what that does is also introduce this question of political urgency or the question of political time. It's like your experiment, your wager, you know, okay, let's over identify with or let's let's accept the definition of, of uh, certain bodies, let's say, as uh, uterus havers or, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's been proposed. Huh? Menstruate, yeah, yeah, and then, you know, that's, yeah, bodies that, that do the certain things. Yeah, I mean, I, absolutely. I, I, I mean, of course, there's always the question of imposition of power, who is saying this, right? And the, the examples I gave were of, you know, people reacted very badly to, like when the Green Party suggested that women would be happy to be described as non-men, this was met with lots of resistance, right? So it's the question of who gets to call who what, right, is of course, we're back, I'm afraid, to the question of power and, and language, right? And you could say, how, how can we exit these postmodern games, you know? in that sense, uh, I agree. I mean, there is a question of legal urgency, which is why this question became extremely, uh, you know, uh, antagonistic in the UK, because there was a proposed legislative change. And this became like a very, you know, again, a question of urgency. It's like, how do we deal with this very uh, radical change proposed in the law, that we, we, that we redefine terms, which would also then mean changing their definition in the dictionary, for example, you know, so again, I'm afraid we're still back with language and power and time and law, you know, and I, and I, but at the same time, I, I, you know, from a materialist point of view, I, I understand what you're saying. I, I, you, we could say like, why not? I mean, let's see experimentally what would be lost and what would be gained if we did this, right? If we stop using these particular words, like let's just say they have, you know, we refuse to, to cling on to old ideas about what women and men mean or refer to, and we simply say, I don't know, there are existence. I mean, I, one of the problems I think is that you end up in a kind of generalized humanism, right? Like you could say that there are uses. What about uses of these words, right? I mean, medically, like we would probably, you know, for shorthand reason, we would want to say women rather than pregnant bodies, but we, or mothers rather than bodies that can birth. I don't know. I mean, I think it'd be very hard to get the medical prof profession to sign up to like these longer de de determinations. Go, no, no, go. In order to, to name somebody, you have to tell like the sentence. 
Yeah. yeah. Ridiculous. But but at the same time, but no, but at the same time, I mean, like I I mean, like why not? Let's, I mean, I absolutely metaphysically, this wager is also like a very interesting one. I mean, it it would also kind of create an issue. I mean, all of violence and personal stuff aside, like, you know, I mean, if those terms are not available to anybody, right? So it, like, if we say that nobody can call themselves a woman or a man, that everybody has to describe themselves as a particular type of body, right? This would be extremely interesting. Then we would evacuate all of those, the desire for those categories. But can we, can we evacuate the desire for, for them? Yeah. <laughs> right? <laughs> But like, why not? Let's let's do a radical evacuation of language. The issue is with like the way in which these categories and their link to like the biological reality is presented as self-evident, and I think that is what what I find can be violent. Yeah, we've just got rid of them. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> no, Didn't you hear? If we go back to like menstruating bodies or uh, women who who can give birth. No, no, we said but then we're not using the word woman. Just bodies that birth or whatever. Let's do it. Okay. I'm being silly. Yeah, please, please speak. I won't interrupt but, you. But that's just it. Ah, okay. So, I mean, I, uh, I didn't, I didn't use the yeah. you know, sex uh, makes a certain gender Life is violent. Nature is violent. But I don't. I don't really want to um, address you polemically so much as I'd like to uh, address you with respect to sort of the question of dialectic. It's interesting when you were talking about um, kind of pitting yourself against postmodern identitarianism, right? Because we know that. On one hand, postmodern culture has been defined by uh, an antagonism towards forms of universality. Uh, on the other hand, it's been defined by, uh, you know, the attempt to latch on to these stable vectors of identity that define our perspective. Right? Um, you know, I think again, if we look at something like dialectics, right, and Alenka to a large degree fleshed this out. Um, you talk about uh, the parallel that's established in Marxism between the proletariat and women, which I think is angled throughout the origin of family private property in the state. I didn't, I didn't yeah. Yeah. You talk you talk about the parallel established between uh, in Marxism between women and the proletariat, which I think is most cleanly established in the origin of family private property in the state, which is a wonderful book and very descriptive uh, about the forms of discrimination that women have historically endured. Um, and again, I think the part the real power, I'm gonna go back to this point of negativity. I think the real power uh, that's been associated with the feminist movement, um, you know, and, and Marx says this to the proletariat too, right? They're commodified, right? They're kind of denatured in this way that actually permits the radical transformation of reality, right? They're exciting. Um, I think that's been in large part the power, right? Of feminism has lied uh, in that negativity. Um, and, you know, it's interesting you talk about someone like Malibu, right? Changing difference. Well, she does acknowledge this violence as part and parcel of, of capitalism, right? Um, you know, in terms of women being defined as a negativity. But she never asserts that there could be a tidy solution to that, right? And I think the reason she doesn't do that is because she understands, she's a good Hegelian, you know, she understands that one can't just go directly to concrete universality, right? That that's actually a process, right? And the risk, of course, if you were to, to go directly to concrete universality, if you were to look to history and say, well, how can we, you know, more straightforwardly and tangibly uh, define what this is, the risk is that you just sort of recapitulate uh, the patriarchal prejudices of the past. I mean, you can give a good example, right? I mean, if you look at the proletarian struggle, see, here's sort of your parallel. Um, you had a lot of factories that were absorbing, um, you know, rural workers in the urban context, right? Um, and again, in that struggle and in the articulation of negativity, there was the potential to, uh, in their commodification, um, to kind of access a certain universality. But if you were to say, oh, well, that, that, that capitalist violence is so intense that the best solution is for them to resort to the patriarchal cultures they come from, or to try to retrieve a kind of essential definition from that prematurely and before that process had been worked out. I mean, I think the obvious parallel when you do that, um, you know, certainly it's not with Marxism, it's much more with far right forms of thought, right? When you, when you go looking for positive content and when you take it that easily, it's something you haven't really earned, right? 
Um, so, you know, I, I would just ask that question to you, how can you possibly, you know, given, given um, you know, the role of social reproduction in history, uh, how decisive that's been uh, for the grounding uh, of the uh, gender sex or, or what have you, how can you possibly bypass that question and move towards citing positive content without risking a very, very, um, you know, I think, again, I say dangerous form of reaction. And I do say risky. Right, because I'm not saying this is necessarily going to occur. Right, there's a lot of vagary about what this would represent. Well, oh, I mean, I think there's been a lot of like rhetorical attempts to paint, particularly uh, left and liberal women who want to suggest that sex is real or pertains to the real, as being reactionary or being proto-reactionary. So you've had a lot of left and liberal women uh, feminists being accused of being fascists and Nazis, right, in recent years, which is absolutely insane. I mean, they. They lean left, left on every single issue, right? Whether it be redistribution of income, you know, social progress, gay rights, everything else, right? Like it, it makes, I, I think it's a really, really rhetorically dangerous strategy to say that anybody who suggests that, for example, biological sex pertains to political life, collective political life, must therefore be on the side of Nazism, as if to suggest that there's, that sexual difference is always something that is held only by reactionary thinkers. And I know you're saying it's risky. You're not saying that everybody who suggests that sexual difference is real is therefore uh, right wing. Um, but I think this is part of the kind of contemporary political problem, actually, like that there, there is no longer an available position. And this is why a lot of people, especially women, they feel politically completely dispossessed, right? But they feel because they feel like all of the major political parties in the UK, for example, have all signed up to this particular agenda, believing it to be progressive, um, but then actually, therefore, because they think it's progressive, having to suggest that any woman who oppose it must be reactionary or regressive, or even far right, right, which simply isn't the case, right, in any of their political positions. And it would be absolutely absurd, I think, for them to be reactionary in this one way, like it simply doesn't make sense, right? So I think we have to come to terms with the idea that not everything that presents itself as progress is progress, right? And I don't think uh, I would go further and say that not everything that's happened in the past and not everything our ancestors did was bad or wrong. You know, I mean, I think this this linear notion of progress isn't dialectical enough itself. I mean, you know, yes, there are always reactionary elements in the workers movement. Let's say let's say, you know, Marx talks about the dissolution of certain bonds and traditions. Right. And he talks about it in an ambiguous but often quite positive way. I mean, you know, like the, the kind of ending of traditions is also the emancipation. It's a certain kind of freedom that moder modernity gives more people, right? You don't have to be tied to a particular community or something like this, you know. But at the same time, it's also a kind of breaking of certain kinds of covenants and rituals and practices as well. Like it's, it's dialectical, like you say. So I think, you know, if we do all collectively, and it has to be a collective decision, give up on a certain old notion of the de definition of sex or sexual difference, right? And we have to do it all together. We have to, at the same time, think about what we lose when we do that, as well as what we gain, you know? And I don't think it is reactionary or right-wing at all to pose any of those questions.